If you're a kid, please make note of this. It's for your own good. I rewrote one part of my past, but I kind of need to rewrite the other part. Let's find out what happens! Some of my favorite moments in the game are final bosses. I know that I reused that line from my previous countdown, but it's relevant here because now, I'm going to explore what can make them so wonderful. The degree of challenge and spectacle they can reach for, and the ways they can bring the game's story to a close, are worth noting and talking about. So it's time I pay this topic a good due. I was actually in a bind as to who should I choose for this topic, and it pained me to leave off certain ones. Heck, you could call choosing for this list as much of a final boss as the ones I'm about to present here, but only 10 made the cut. And thus... This climax is about to unfold. Even after all this time, I still consider Sonic Colors my absolute favorite Sonic game. The sheer spectacle it provides with every level, as well as what it did to refine the boost gameplay that games like Unleashed got the ball rolling for, makes this an unforgettable experience that I love going back to. And by extension, yeah, my love for the game's final boss, the Nega Wisp Armor, holds up. It is true that this boss is pretty short and not among the most challenging in the series, but man is this fight fun and satisfying. Eggman truly does pull out all the stocks with this creation, unleashing several attacks that represent various wisps that you use throughout the whole game, and even making some creative uses by combining them to force some really intricate ways of fighting. And as you go on, these attacks will only grow more fast and frantic, so if you're not paying attention, some move could sneak up on you when you least expect it. I also kind of like how if you do get hit, the game does punish you by giving Eggman another attack to do, encouraging you to dodge as much as you can and beat it as fast as you can. Though, if you are observant, you should be fine. Like I said, this is a pretty straightforward boss when you get down to it, and I will admit that it is a bummer that it is so short, which is especially notable by the fact that you only get to hear the sublime second phase music for 30 seconds unless you drag out the fight on purpose, but that's really a small gripe because the amount of creativity and charm put into this one fight was enough to win me over. Also, you cannot tell me that the Final Color Blaster isn't awesome. You just can't. Ooh, going from one of my favorite games of all time to another one of my favorite games of all time. We're starting out strong here. I talked about how much I loved one moment in Birthright in one countdown, and thought the finale of Conquest was a load of no in another. So going by that, expectations would probably go to me bringing up Revelation. And if you expected that, you'd be right. Revelation is my personal favorite of the three routes and fates. I loved how all this final route brought the two kingdoms together and let them interact with one another. The maps are some of my favorites in all Fire Emblem. And rather stick to the final boss in norm of the series, Anankos decides to break some traditions and become pretty spectacular for the finale. Usually when it comes to Fire Emblem boss battles, I mostly pay attention to the build-up and storytelling surrounding it, rather than the gameplay, because most of them are just stronger units with higher stats and maybe a more dangerous skill. Anarchos does a great job with build-up and a solid job with narration, but to my bewilderment, he managed to make the gameplay stand out. I mean, the first phase is pretty straightforward, with bulldozing through his army to get to him and take him down, but when phase 2 commences and he is truly let loose, that's when the fight takes off. Given his gargantuan size, this fight requires you to go after multiple targets instead of a single one. The arms are on both sides of the arena, so right off the bat, there's some strategy involved. There are a few kinds of enemies on each side of the arena, and Anonko says the same stats on both arms, encouraging you to divide your units to go after specific ones, because it'll be really hard and complicated to have one unit do it, unless you are loaded with rescue staffs, and you know where to get Azura to sing. And after those go down, his head will be low enough for you to go and destroy it, revealing the core, and destroying that too. But this is by far harder to do, as Anonko's stats do get higher after each phase, so the trick is deciding who should go in and attack him, and when you should heal when it's needed. But despite these growing stats and a few normal enemies that do come back on certain turns, it never gets to a cheap state. Unless you don't take certain things into account, you should be able to figure out what to do, given what you have at your disposal and the amount of space you have to work with. And I much prefer a design like this over the game shoving enemies and projectiles down your throat. I love how well this fight tests you in different ways that some maps don't, and I immensely respect how well Vates took one aspect the Fire Emblem was not known for, and made it to be a highlight in the series to close things off. <sighs> Man, I love Vates. Van Grants has become one of my favorite villains in any RPG. 
His motives are completely understandable and justified, the way he goes about things is insane, while with replicating all of existence, and despite this, he is genuinely human. He doesn't feel like your generic monster kind of villain, but rather someone who has formulated his own ideologies and stuck to them throughout his life. And that heart is certainly put forth into his fights, especially the final confrontation with him on Eldrint. At this point, Luke has become a true human and gained a newfound power, and Van has absorbed Lorelai, a sentient phonon of sound, into his body. Again, gaining newfound power. And with everyone's motivations being brought forth at center stage, the setup is already complete, and the fight delivers. Van fights similarly to how he did back when you fought him at the Absorption Gate, in that he uses many strong physical arts with the sword, including some arcane arts, as well as various high-leveled spells that can hurt quite a bit, but get even stronger if he manages to steal certain FOF circles from you. He's also one of few bosses in the game that has two Mystic Arts, which hurt. A lot. And the thing is, this is when he has yet to use Lorelei's full power, when he does use that power in the second phase, things get even harder. His stats increase, he uses stronger arts much more frequently, and he has access to some stronger magic spells and a completely new mystic art. So you really have to pay attention to what he does and really get the jump on him, as getting too reckless and falling into one of his stronger attacks is no doubt something to avoid. But despite this power, Van is by no means unfair. He has a lot to work with, but the game gives you plenty of chances to stagger him, and most of the time if your party gets slammed, it's because of player error rather than the game deciding it doesn't want you to go on. This fight can go on for a little while, especially if you're stuck in an item situation, but the fight is so much fun regardless, and when you deplete his health and land that final radiant howl, that is pure satisfaction you get for finishing this game. I should really be talking about this game as much as I can. With all the amazing scenarios and fun challenges Astral Chain is constantly throwing at you, and considering who's behind the development wheel of it all, it's fairly obvious that the finale would be amazing. With how serious and personal things have become, the final level throws everything it can at you and tests everything that you've learned. Then you get to your final opponent, the exact thing that the second main villain of the game, Yosef Calvert, wanted to change the world with. Which is... Oh my! Yeah, with how much data Yosef recorded throughout the game, he sure outdid himself by making this titan. Now, okay sure, the fight starts off as more so visually impressive than fun to play, with platforming to avoid Noah's onslaught, but things get better and better once he sucks you into the white void, leaving you to destroy the core. This core may be a stationary target, but with its ability to send out very damaging projectiles, shadowy figures, and a shield, this is a fight you can't be slacking off on. But even after getting totaled and the absorbed soul of your younger sibling impaling the absorbed soul of Yosef, Noah's still got some fight left and turns it to... Cars from JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. Sure, why not? And besides, this is what most people will remember this fight for. If you feel like everything prior was a little too easy for your liking, and that not much was required out of you, Noah Prime over here is going to dropkick your face, wake you up, get rid of your coffee, and tell you to go to the ends of the earth to claim your victory. That's a long translation to, MAN CAN THIS THING FIGHT! He's got a ton of attacks that come out very quickly and can combo you easily, as well as some projectiles that really hurt. But it's done in a way that works. Every action you do in this fight counts. From when you pull out your legion, from when you decide to take the offensive, to when he decides to unleash certain attacks, or even completely alter the arena you're fighting on. You will be tested in this fight, and there's little room for error, especially when it grows another pair of arms and turns red. Here, he's even faster and carries things like powerful rush attacks, to wormholes, to spirit bombs! He fights like everything is on the line, so it's all down to what you know about Astral Chain, and bring it forth to triumph over him. Noah's no joke, but when you deplete that health, and use all of your legions to lay the coup de gras, that feels good. And it comes together with a really emotional ending to bring this phenomenal game to a satisfying conclusion. It's Hades. I'm pretty sure most of you saw this coming, but honestly, I love this battle so much that I had to include it somewhere on here. Not to mention I love this guy as a character and as a villain completely, but details. After this dark guy with a smarmy attitude has had a strong presence throughout the game ever since the end of the first arc, pretty much causing all the events that got this game's equivalent of Mother Nature and an alien race of all things involved, this final confrontation with him fires on all cylinders and doesn't let up. 
In each of the four phases, he's not only looking completely fabulous and giving us more of the amazing writing that blesses this game, but he's throwing all kinds of different tests at you, from things like hauling projectiles on a twister in phase 1, to base guns in phase 2, to the devastation ensemble in phase 3 with a drill for good measure. Not even cutting him in half finishes him off, leading to a fourth phase where you play more defensively on deciding what shots you should fire at. And then your wreck is destroyed. Welp, rest in peace great sacred treasure. But even after that, and after unknowingly guiding Medusa of all people to decapitate Hades only for him to gain a new head, there's still one thing left to do. Charge the gun of the great sacred treasure, avoid Hades' lasers, and let loose one final blast, ending things once and for all. For one of my all-time favorite games, this was a fantastic note to end on. I love how each hard of the fight does something completely different, while still challenging the player with what they know about Uprising's gameplay. I love how much extra humor the game throws in for good measure, and being this boss and the whole game is just a filling. And for added info, Hades is not actually dead. His body was just destroyed, so I believe he'll come back. Someday. As I've said in the past, things that can make a Pokemon battle for me besides solid team compositions are the character you are battling against, any sort of development with that character, and the sheer tone of the fight. When all are done well, Pokemon battles can be enhanced all the more for me. Isn't that right, new best professor? I was legit surprised when I got to this moment. I was so used to seeing rivals or NPCs you befriend to be the final bosses in made Pokemon games, but here, Alola's Pokemon League is still really new, so technically, you're the first champion of Alola. Professor Kakui here is just one of the guys who founded it, but it honestly fits so much for him to be the final boss because he helped you kickstart your adventure and pitched in quite a lot over the course of the game. Having to take him on as your final challenge just wraps up all the journey both you and he did in Alola in a beautiful bow. And he actually came prepared with a great variety of Pokemon on his team. His Lycan Rock and Ninetales are both fast and have solid attacking stats for what they are. His Braviary both hits hard and has Tailwind giving his team an advantage. He's got a Magnezone that can really knock you down a peg if you play your cards wrong. Snorlax is pretty much the king it always has been, and he'll have whatever starter yours is weak to complete with the Z-Crystal of their type. So let's hope one of your team members compliments your starter well. Kukui really does show the extent of his research, but he doesn't utilize any stupid strategies or have any sort of advantages you see in a competitive play. At this point in the game, you should have a well-balanced team fit to take on whatever he has, so if you got this far, you'll be able to figure out his team and beat it. On top of the fact that I enjoy fighting Kakui's team, one thing about this fight that really gets to me is how Kakui treats it. Throughout the whole game, he always admired your potential and how strong you were getting, even giving you particular rewards at points. And this battle feels like this is him congratulating you on how far you have come, and just wanting to cap things off with something for you and him to enjoy. And if there's one thing I enjoy in Pokemon battles, it's the feeling of impact between you and the character in question. Kakui, you're an absolute Chad, and don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Oh, this was a hard one. Choosing from the Elite Four Kirby Final Bosses. Kirby bosses overall get the job done, but most of them are not anything that amazing in my opinion. But four recent Kirby games have provided four absolutely brilliant Final Bosses. Choosing just one of them was another fight in and of itself. But then I remembered the one that lets you fuse one of the best mechanics in Kirby, the robot armor from Planet Robot, with Meta Knight's Halibird. So I think we have a winner. The fact that you get to make this fusion is amazing enough, but that is only the beginning as to what makes Planet Robot's final boss, Star Dream, completely magnificent. Despite the fact that all you need to do is shoot away and win, there are a ton of things flying at you at once. Portals that shoot bullets, missiles, the always classic shoop the whoop and even meteors. Heck, Star Dream even gets the idea to shield himself at points, which is refreshing to see. One thing I like about this is that many of these attacks can be destroyed and absorbed into a stronger gun that allows you to fire for an even stronger blast. This really does incentivize playing well, rewards you for doing so, and makes this battle more varied than it would be if you just had the normal blaster with you. And that's just the first phase. Afterwards, Star Dream literally becomes a Death Star. When I first got to this part, I was legitimately kind of intimidated. Star Dream uses the very base that infiltrated and mechanized Planet Popstar from the very beginning, and from there, the attacks let loose get even harder to avoid. The computer system may now be a bigger target, but with these upgrades and new attacks, this is where the fight can legitimately get pretty tough. Even the armor you chip off at during this phase can hurt you, and this thing is not afraid to get physical. But after beating this phase, it's revealed that the Axis Arc is another Galactic Nova, like what Superstar had. And things not only get crazier, but also weirder. Everything Star Dream does from here on out is not only conceptually trippy, but also harder to avoid than before. 
This is basically keeping your hen chick and bringing yourself to deplete his health one last time. And you're still not done! You know that Giga Drill Break from Gurren Logon? Yeah, you basically get to do that and completely decimate Star Dream for good. Holy cow, what a fight that was! This is my example of a final boss having a completely different gameplay style from the rest of the game done properly. There is not a single dull moment in this fight, and it is yet another reason why I can call this my favorite Kirby game. I cannot help myself to that. Even if their games are just non-stop throw rights that never let up, Platinum Games finds a way to fit in climaxes that just keep on building until they reach one grand moment where everything comes together. I already mentioned how fantastically Astral Chain does this, so let's talk about the real superpower of teamwork. The Wonderful 101 was already such a creative game that kept on throwing crazy things at you, but that final level is when they crank things up to 101. Let's see, shooting sections where you take down some of the strongest enemies in the game with ease, a part where you use a satellite as a cannon to wipe out an entire fleet, only for it to be replaced by another fleet and a dead star, sections of hijacking robots, and a set piece where you get to have one of your gravest rivals at your side. Did all that sound insane? Good, because this is all before you actually take on the fortress for the final battle. And I don't mean any sort of infiltration or different levels. I meant fighting the supreme overlord of Geth Jerk, Jerkinga, who really is the fortress. Admittedly, it starts off pretty serviceable with you only having to destroy each node on the machine containing Jerkinga's reign, turning the knob in the arena for the next one, and repelling the machine's tentacles, some of which contain attacks from previous bosses. But after that, and a pretty neat, albeit a bit there done that monologue, Things kick into overdrive! Jerking and donning a wonder mask of his own isn't just an appearance upgrade, I mean it is true that he does go from looking fine to actually really menacing, but things get upgraded by the way he fights. Using the forms of various Unite Morphs, he's got a multitude of attacks you need to be wary of, some of which cannot be blocked, and even has one to seal off a certain Unite Morph off from you. There's a ton of things he can do, but to give you the edges at some points, you can actually use certain attacks against him to stun him earlier than intended and speed up the fight that way, which feels great. But even after shattering his Wonder Mask and his power along with it, and having the Virgin Victory get involved for brain frying time, and then escaping with what you have if you can believe it, Jerkinga actually isn't done yet. He's got one last form to take down, his Planet Destruction Form. With its enormous size, it's time to use the Platinum Robo and a force of other robots to break his shields, get to him, and destroy the cores on his body. That last part in particular is a decent challenge because despite both you and him floating in space, neither of you are sitting ducks, as you can easily target the cores on him with all you have, but his attacks pack a wall up and can catch you off guard if you're not careful. But even after all that, taking hits from all you Night Morphs, and receiving an Ultra Platinum Headbutt to the moon, you're still not done! Jerkingen gives himself enough time to fire his CHIQ Marble Buster, which gives you enough time to fire your final ultimate legendary Earth Power Supermax Justice Future Miracle Dream Beautiful Galaxy Big Bang Little Bang Sunrise Starlight Infinite Fabulous Totally Final Wonderful Arrow, I know what I said, both collide and give the Planet Robo Controls a workout, I know what I said, and then that does Jerkingen in. Woo! That was a lot to take in. But honestly, that's why I adore this fight so much. There is so much happening here, but it never gets truly lost in the moment. Everything you have fought for is brought forth here, and it really does sum up how nuts the wonderful 101 truly is. Regardless of how much time passes, some things never truly change. In this case, it's because of nanomachines. Son. Metal Gear Rising was already a ridiculous game that had so many creative boss designs, but ironically, the one that they went bananas with the most is literally a senator from Colorado who makes big speeches about having your own dreams and using them to make America great again. They don't hold back in the cutscenes, and what surprised me is that they included some of that thought-provoking poetry that Kojima is known for. Armstrong may be behind so many atrocities and have many corrupt qualities, but he's actually fighting to end all conflict. He's viewed many previous wars within the Metal Gear Saga as meaningless, and believes the hearts and minds of everyone grew for the worse. So he's basically fighting fire with fire to go for the best possible outcome. It's actually quite intricate when you think about it, so much so that Ryan actually thinks about all of that and actually adopts some of his views by endgame, though because Armstrong's process is morally wrong, he still has the courtesy to call Armstrong, as he so puts it, batch insane. It honestly makes the cutscenes before the fight, along with some admittedly funny shots and absolutely priceless lines. With good storytelling and beautiful atmosphere of a pit covered with destroyed metal in hand, the actual fight begins, and it is absolutely stunning. 
powered up by narrow machines, Armstrong can release several fiery attacks, punch you so hard that he can knock your sword away, and throw pieces of the destroyed Metal Gear Excelsis at you. He deals a lot of damage and does not let up, meaning you have to find weak spots in his attacks and get the jump on him. Every mechanic you do with a sword is put to good use here, and even expert players will need to watch their step. And when you make use of all you can to come out on top, that blade mode finisher will be all the more satisfying. There is little I can actually find wrong in this battle. The intricate writing, the beautiful atmosphere, the incredible music, the dazzling way it plays, the gratifying moves you can do with good play, even the quick time events are done right. Everything just comes together to create an entire moment that has stuck with me for a very long time. We're almost at the top, but first, I want to pay some other final bosses a bit of praise too. Ray Fadler from Uncharted 4, my example of a quick time event fest boss done right. The Pirate Master from Shantae and the Pirate's Curse. Challenging and fun with some killer music. What more can be asked? Zanza from Xenoblade Chronicles. Yet again, challenging and fun, and the storytelling and writing here is just sublime. Leon from Pokemon Sword and Shield, a total chat of a character who you bonded with throughout the game who also has a fantastic lineup of Pokemon. Beasley from Tales of Celia 2. New Chromatis form, plus amazing music, plus formidable opponent, equals yes. And finally, Magalore from Kirby's Return to Dreamland. Immense power to work with, all of it is displayed here in full force. <laughs> the climax to Kingdom Hearts 3 is one of my personal favorite moments in any game ever. From frame 1 when you arrive in the Keyblade Graveyard, the game is throwing every last exciting thing, every mind-screwing event, and every emotional moment at you, and it'll take you for a giant ride. On top of all that, the climax has some amazing bosses, and even sets the stakes for the one fight against the true mastermind behind everything that went wrong in the Kingdom Hearts series. With the situation seeming dire, and with Keyblade in hand, every last bit of enthrallment and emotion comes forth in this masterful duel against Master Xehanort. Immediately donning dreaded armor and turning the world you fight him in into a twisted playground that even Doctor Strange will be impressed with, Xehanort's not holding back. With attacks like shredding you as if his keyblade was a buzzsaw, swapping the entire arena with fire, and planting dark spells to trap you for an easy picking, he's fighting with every last bit of his strength, and you need to do the same in order to have him not deplete your health in a matter of seconds. He even changes the scenario mid-fight by taking you underwater and eventually in the air in the midst of all the destruction. But with the game's much improved water combat and expanded air combat, these two phases are just as fun as the one on the ground. You have plenty of space to work with in these parts of the fight, but Xehanor does make changes to accommodate for this without feeling unfair. It really works given the fight's atmosphere, and make you feel like you have room to succeed, but not too much room. But then the armor comes off, and he unleashes the Keyblade at the highest point in the world. And this view of Kingdom Hearts is where you sell things with them once and for all. This phase of the fight goes even further in testing you with what you truly learned at the game, and what kinds of cool things you can come up with, as Xehanort will perform even crazier attacks that require keen observation to avoid, and will even force you into rage form at one point. Your own skill is the only thing that will triumph here. This is a fight where you cannot afford to slip up on. He may not have anything unfair, but he's very quick to react to openings should you give him one. At the same time, there are enough opportunities to fight back, even if he knocks you into the air. This fight rewards good offensive play and defensive play, like a good fight against a well-knowledged master should. And I always love that. And after enduring a supposed death only for you to come back through your own determination, and laying loose one final beam of light to show that your friends are indeed your power, that final blow is a complete sensation unlike any other. For so many games, so many wacky directions the plot went, and for so much build-up, Master Xehanort delivered one of the best fights I have legit ever played in any game. The set pieces all work and help diversify everything, the various attacks are creative, the difficulty is perfect, the spectacle is a feast for the eyes, the fight plays just about perfectly, and that finisher and ending really brought forth the proper conclusion to everything. It's everything I love in a boss battle and then some, and my expectations were surpassed with flying colors. I am the Lightning Ripper, and despite the fact that this is not the end of Kingdom Hearts as a whole, I could not have asked for a better way to close off this chapter.